And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of a man who wa who wants more steam more steam in his in his punk, and and of the defenders of the new century up upcoming TRPG, the one and only Lewis Johnson. How are you doing today, man? Hello, I'm doing well. Good evening to everyone. The, the ceiling in this temple is absolutely incredible. I must <laughs> say, it's, it's a wonderful place to be. No, I'm doing fine, thank you very much. Or as, or as well as could be expected in this, uh, not pre- or post-apocalypse, but apocalyptic world we seem to exist in right now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I think. As far as apocalypses go, look, I live in, Min I look in, I live in Minnesota. Half of, the, half of the year is a frozen wasteland. And the other half of the year? <laughs> the other half of the year, I'm dodging mosquitoes. Well, it's it's it sounds just like Scotland, which is where I'm from. So I think we could uh, I think we could have a little bit of a geographical love there. But yeah, it's a uh, it's hell of a time right now in winter, isn't it? Not that I'll date this podcast anyway. So yeah. Well, the the um the worst of winter hasn't hit hasn't hit here yet. That's not going to happen for a couple of months. Um. Be, and by that and by that point, it's going to be a case of nobody's going to want to go outside if even if they um even if they were unless they're getting paid to. Because once ja once January hits, things get ugly, like no, like never in never in pop, never in um, double digits ugly. Well, it it does reach double digits. It's just negative twenty Fahrenheit or whatever. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I would go I would go into specific numbers, but I don't feel like doing um, Fahrenheit to Celsius conversions right now. Yeah, you know, I think I think we're in our off time at the minute, so let's try not to do any maths homework while we're here. <laughs> yeah. um, all I'll say is that in, any, um, no matter how cold it gets, it's still not going to be as bad as the polar vortex from a few years ago, where it was 65 below once you factored in wind chill. Okay, uh, well I know, th here's a fun fact for you, minus 40 degrees Celsius to minus 40 Fahrenheit is uh, the same, which means I know that minus 65 Fahrenheit must be fucking cold, so good to know. <laughs> Well, it was cold enough that my boss emailed me and said, "Don't come in." <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, that. Hey, that, it swings swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He ba he basically put he basically um put everybody on, put everybody on leave for a couple for a couple of days because he didn't want anybody driving on slip on the um frozen roads. Yeah, I was going to say that that does sound somewhat dangerous, and uh, as I understand it, Minnesota's a rather big place. So you're probably going to be driving a lot to get around. But yeah, so anyway, now that we've got everyone suitably in the mood of a freezing wasteland, <laughs> do we want to do we want to talk about my game? Yeah. So <laughs> we'll op we'll open up with the humble beginnings, as it were. I just want I just wanted yeah. to build a bit of momentum. So, what was your introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? So, my introduction to role-playing games was when I was 14. I went and visited my uncle up in Edinburgh, which uh, I live in England at the minute, which is not, not, not that sizable a distance, but when you're 14, it's quite a bit. And I got introduced to the darling of the entire industry. That's right, D&D 4th Edition, the most well-regarded and well-remembered D&D edition of the wall. Hey, um, hey, I like 4th Edition. <laughs> what are you talking about? So, 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 so did I. It's, uh, it was, the thing is, it was really difficult five years later when everyone was talking about how 3.5 kicked all ass and i'm like what the fuck is 3.5 <laughs> you know? but um I, I ended up getting introduced to fourth ed and we did a little tutorial session for my teenage ass and uh it was a wonderful time but i had absolutely no idea what i was doing and we loved it so the week after when i went back down i told my warhammer friends listen there's a single role playing and we absolutely have to give it a go uh, but being a poor little kid down in England, of course, we couldn't afford uh, 40 quid, you know, play a rule book or $50 or whatever it is. Uh, so I ended up remembering all of the rules that I could. We wrote them down into a Word document, and then that was how we played tabletop. So from the beginning, I was already making my own games and my own rules. And I think it just stuck because we all got so involved in that creation process from the start, and just there was nothing like it. We never made a game before properly anyway. And I think we could agree that tabletop is just 
utterly unique in that regard, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, we did get the rulebook eventually, uh, and then after that, I moved on to the next darling of the indie, uh, of the not indie rather, but just uh, the RPG community, which is Shadowrun Fifth Edition. So I apparently liked rules <laughs> from the beginning, although I ended up tearing about two thirds of the rules out of that. And then after that, I've pretty much just been making my own games, really. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that, that's that's the humble beginnings of the game, really, which is yeah. somebody so poor to buy a game he made his own. So there you go. <laughs> well. Um... Necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. That's the phrase. That's the one. Yeah, we ended up making our own classes and everything. It was based off of World of Warcraft uh, characters. It was brilliant. <laughs> and my, I had my one mate who played a druid, and all he could turn into was whatever models we happened to have on hand for Warhammer Fantasy. So uh, <laughs> there was uh, <laughs> there was a lot of wolves and not too many other interesting things. Oh, I was I was hoping he could I was hoping he could turn into giant trees. Uh, oh, we we did have a bush once. So he turned to a bush, and then the other one we had is we had a single model from the World of Warcraft board game, which I couldn't believe existed until I saw it. So he could also become an owl bear, which is a bit of an upgrade, I must confess. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we did our best with that. So that, that that was that was the humble beginnings, as it were. And um, re really, I've um, not played too many other role playing games just because we had such a pedigree of making our own from the start. So yeah. And that was mine, anyway. It's in, it's interesting that you en you ended up going from D D and D fourth edition to Shadowrun fifth edition to what to what to what amounts to a turn a turn of the century g game yeah, with, um, it, without, with elements <laughs> of tech punk. It's in the middle, isn't it? Like if you take the time periods and you sort of slap them together. Well, um, the, the reason that the game is set so Defender of the New Century refers to the, the of the New Century part mm -hmm. refers to the fact that it's set in a, a version of 1901. Now it's not set on Earth or anything similar. It's set in a land called Saluna, mm -hmm. and the idea is that there is magic in the world, but it's rigorously scientific. Like that. That's a big thrust behind it. It's not like wave your hands and summon a fairy and make a wish. It's there are 48 spells. There they are. They do the same thing. Uh, and a part of that scientific rigor was because I really wanted to capture that essence at the turn of the century of scientific knowledge and, you know, the scientific revolution as well as everything else. But the real reason I wanted to do it was because D&D um, &D has its class systems, and I eventually got a bit tired of the class systems because they, they're amazing for making sure that everyone can engage with the content. But what I found was a real struggle was because you could describe an entire character as I'm a tiefling warlock. Now, that's amazing, but on the other hand, it's like... That's most of my character described. Whereas Shadowrun, I feel so open with its class system, uh, with its classless system, uh, but it almost doesn't go hard enough to my mind. It feels like have you ever have you ever played a decent amount of Shadowrun? Yes, I've yeah, it, I've, <laughs> I've been play I've um I've played off and on with Sh with Shadowrun um through um th I started with I started with third for a tiny bit um had a mixed attitude about it for various reasons. Got was back third the one with, with the like forty minute tech turns or whatever it was. With third edition they tried to do this idea of doing separate of doing complete of completely separating, say, um the ma in actions in the matrix and actions in the astral plane from physical actions and it ended up being really messy. Yeah, it's bonkers. That just means that your entire table bar one person sat there for forty minutes at a time, then vice versa. Yeah, just, and yeah. um they they uh dr so when fourth edition started ha started happening, they dropped that, and they've gone for they've gone further away. From, they've gone um, and then they haven't come back to that whole idea since. Even even with um, with fifth with fifth edition trying to trying to streamline some of the class setups, and si and sixth edition trying to make edge. A little bit more of an expanded oh, concept. Yeah, I, I, t I took a brief look at that. The reception for Sith, Sixth Ed hasn't been great, has it? I um I reviewed Sixth Edition a while back, and I basically said I can see what's going what's going on, and there and um I do think that the skill list for Shadowrun needed some simplification because there were too many skills yes. that were far too situational. Yep. Um, Absolutely. It feel it leans a little. bit... It leans a little bit into feng, into feng shui, but I had said, I'm holding off on it for now. What I'm waiting for is the inevitable successor to the runner's toolkit, and then I'm going to come back and take yeah. it. Just some, like, you know, R Rigger's expanded book, because the Rigger's got, like, what, four pages or whatever it was in the book, maybe less. Yeah. Yeah, but... Um... 
but yeah, so uh, so as you're aware of them from Shadowrun, it feels like every character in that's got an expiration date of about six sessions. And I really, we, we had a long-term Shadowrun campaign. And by the time you hit, I don't know, maybe 150 karma or so, the characters were just overpowered beyond reason because they were kind of supposed to die or retire before that point. So I almost feel like Shadowrun was a classless system, but it didn't go far enough in the fact that the characters now have longevity. But on the other hand, as you've already alluded to, I can't even remember the number of skills and skill groups that were in that game. And you could trim away, I want to say, a third of it, and you wouldn't really miss out on much. Or at the very least, you could combine certainly a lot of skills in that down to a third. And um, that's what we ended up doing. We practically tore out a third of that rule book just because there's that awful range table at the back, which lets you calculate for every single weather condition, velocity, and so on in the game. And we just found it slow down the turns so it just felt there was a good middle ground between the, the restrictiveness of the class-based D system and also the classlessness that shadowrun provided and then over four and a half years that sort of combination has just evolved into what the game is today really uh you can still feel the echoes of both of those games influencing it but it feels like every patch of the game that we did just took out more of that influence as time went on particularly the Shadowrun influence, where we found that the design decisions just didn't really fit what we were going for. And uh, the big thrust of it, of the game, is the fact that it's a fully classless system. Uh, there, there is no real class into it. There's obviously builds. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nearly 200 qualities in the game which let you upgrade your character. And that's the main way the characters sort of express themselves mechanically in the game. So some of those qualities are like 8 experience points. You take one less damage from all sources. Or another one is 25 experience points. If you're using a shotgun, you can use both barrels and then you add two damage dice or whatever and uh through that you make your build is is the basic idea but the whole point of it is that there is a coexistence between magic melee guns social intelligent builds and the superpower that you get uh mm -hmm. which informs that turn of the 20th century really because it's the only time where you can have bolt action rifles and halberds exist at the same time and for them to be reasonably on the same level don't get me wrong it's not exactly realistic there's a lot of concessions that the game makes for example gunpowder is like one of the most expensive commodities in that world and that's the reason why guns are really hard to uptake and that's mm -hmm. why people still use swords and so on but even then i think we've you know done as best as we conceivably could to make sure that anyone can express pretty much any build that they want to in the game yeah and when it comes to doing classless um approaches because this is something I've seen quite quite a bit, is they sometimes end up running into a problem known as choice paralysis, where there's just w there's just way too many options, and somebody is angsting over, okay, is this is this pick that I make now going to bite me in the ass a few sessions from now? Um, how have you guys opted to address the um is the issue of choice paralysis and making sure that people have at least some idea of how they can accomplish the concept that they have in their head so probably the biggest one is that and again this is definitely ingrained from the old Shadowrun influences that there's a priority system at the beginning of the game for your character creation so rather than it just being you've got 200 experience points to spend on whatever it's you have to assign priorities a b c d e in skills attributes magic uh your contract points the contract is your superpower and i'm sure we'll get onto that mm -hmm. uh and then your luck points slash resources luck functions identically to edge um as far as when you're actually in the game, uh, well, there's a lot of options that you can take. And to be honest, I'm not sure we've really exhausted all the options that builds are going to take. I think that choice paralysis is definitely a concern, but hopefully that's one thing which the contract system does address, which is the superpowers. I should probably get into those because they're, they're probably the, uh, the the main thing that gets talked about in the game, really. Uh, in the game, you can have a superpower. Every player has to have one. <laughs> it's not optional. You get one. Um, there you go. And uh, <laughs> What you do is you assign a number of points to it and negotiate with the GM a number of uses, the potency of the contract, uh, and how many uses you get of it. And that's that's it, really. That's how uh, you, the, the superpower is done. And uh, to be honest, we've never had much of an issue with that choice paralysis because the priority system does the first bit. But secondly, we've never found a build left behind because the builds can always fall back on that really key identity of that superpower, right? All right. Uh, yeah. Oops, sorry, gone. Now, the way you des the way you describe contract in a in a weird way reminds me of the one unique thing in um Thirteenth Age. That's literally age. what. Yeah. That's literally yeah. what's called the one unique thing. And 
within the now with within the text, have you put consideration into putting advice about what what constitutes a good idea for a contract and what constitutes an idea that the GM might um, raise their eyebrow a little bit at? Yes, there, there's practically an entire page on guidance for contracts because that that is where there is that potential for choice paralysis. The main thing which distinguishes it from the Thirteenth Age is the fact the Thirteenth Age, and I have played Thirteenth Age and I did enjoy it is that the one unique thing is definitely a narrative unique thing, if you mm -hmm. know what I mean. I am the last noble scion of this age. I am the person who is related to the Dragon Knight or, or whatever. You know, I can't remember the exact 13 factions in that game. Uh, whereas the contract is pretty much a purely mechanical thing, and it's up to the players to flesh it out narratively. So that's probably the biggest distinguishing point between the two. Um, we talk a lot about what would inspire a decent contract. And the thing is, it's uh, it's essentially a scale of how powerful you want it to be. So I probably say that the biggest influence on what quite a few contracts people use are anime or video games. These are proven like really successful. So, you know, uh, the guy who could move sand from Naruto uh, was probably one of the most popular contracts we had. Uh, Accelerator from Railgun was another one. Absorbing people's attributes and qualities from that dude from Reincarnated as a slime. I think that's just, yeah, the, the, the slime dude. Um, but the point is, depending on the number of points that you invest in the contract, that will increase its power. So the maximum you can invest into it is seven. So potentially shifting sand can turn into, with one point invested into it, okay, I can shift, you know, 10 kilograms worth of sand all the way up to it. Seven points is I'm moving half a ton of sand every turn. And that can be used to bury enemies. It can be used to create bridges. It can be used to create cover. And after that point, it's really up to the imagination of the player as to how it gets used. Uh, there is some guidance uh, as to whether it goes right or wrong, but one of the systems it is in the game is you can invest ex experience points into the contract and make it more powerful or branch it in different directions or give it different powers uh one of the other limiting factors of a contract is how the price for it is decided so the reason it's called a contract is because there's a price for all of them and prices are determined on character creation where all the players and all, and all the gm and the gm write down one easy three medium and one hard price where the examples are given in the book so an easy price is you know write down uh, 10 lines of uh, poetry a medium one could be something like you know we've had some conceptual ones like put on a soup kitchen or uh, conduct a radio play and some other ones are just basic sort of you know grim mutilation stuff you know break a finger or whatever and then the hard ones get you know pretty difficult is the idea that they're they're a step up from the medium uh and these aren't designed to stop people from using their contract they're designed to make it so it can't just be spammed in combat or something similar and it gives an interesting narrative direction to the character because deliberately each character gets a randomly allocated price uh so it just gives like a weird element to each of them and these prices are never so bad that a contract build doesn't work it's just that they're inconvenient if that makes sense so that's been a really useful method to sort of uh taper the contracts off at the end and make sure they don't go too out of control mm -hmm. and i'm and when it comes now um the other... Now, one thing I will note, since you mentioned priority system, um, at least when it comes to Shadowrun, that's um, f that's actually fairly recent. Fifth edition was what was the first time that they did that. Mm. It um it what it wasn't in it wasn't in um fourth edition. Um, and in my I know some people didn't like it because it made things a little less free. Um. But they are. They already gave. They already gave an option for free form, so it's not like it wouldn't be that much of a loss. But it helped make things a little bit um, saner when I needed to make characters quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It, it takes about an hour to make a character in uh, in Donk, which is something that we're quite proud of. Actually, it's a relatively pick up and play. <laughs> yeah, and you're. Fr and given that, given the influence of Shadowrun, you're probably familiar with the other running gag, which is. Way, 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 way too many six siders. <laughs> yes, yeah, measure, measuring dice by the pound. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. It's uh, there is a dice pool system in the game, but it's mm -hmm. rare that the number of d6s goes past uh, 15, and uh, uh, that's actually only for out of combat that we have the dice pool system. Mm -hmm. For in combat, it's a d20 plus modifier system. Uh, the former dice pool system is meant to represent specialized knowledge. So um, probably the most common skill taken in the game is engineering, uh, because there is a real emphasis in the game of being able to think your way out of problems. And mm -hmm. uh, same with the social skills. Um, I don't know if you ever had the chance to play the Shadowrun video games, uh, but probably which, um, which, uh, Shadowrun Returns. Ones? Sorry, Shadowrun Returns, the newer ones oh, uh, by oh, the, Hair Rain. Um, the Hair sorry, Rain another... trilogy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there's been there's been there's been multiple attempts to 
Yeah, yeah, the most main game. Go. So, yeah, sorry, my bad. Go, at first, I was gonna go like, wait, the wait, the shooter version. Yeah, or, or, oh god, no. Oh, I remember playing that. <laughs> I remember playing the uh, demo for that on Xbox 360. It was so shit. <laughs> it was, was, it was basically... Yeah. <laughs> remember I, the giant I remember, I remember, I remember playing that at a, de at a, um, at a demo at, a, at my LGS, and I'm thinking, you've got, a, you've got a setting as rich as Shadowrun, and you just do a Team remix Fortress of... Team or whatever. It was, yeah. it, was tr it was a poor man's Counter-Strike. That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so crap. <laughs> I mean, granted, I but didn't, yeah. ha I didn't have, um, I didn't have um, the kind of tryhard accuracy I see in I see in Counter Strike, and that's why I never really got on with that game. But at the same, t at the same time, the whole, sh the whole, the whole buying items thing. That's that was fucking. That was <laughs> a fucking. That, Counter -Strike that's Counter Strike. Thing. Yeah, I was gonna say no, not that game. Thankfully, yeah. that game. But one, one of the best things that that game did was the etiquette system, mm -hmm. which was where, regardless of your charisma, you could have gang etiquette or um, you know pl pl uh, police etiquette or mm -hmm. shadow runner etiquette, and uh, it meant that a low charisma character could always engage in social situations if the other people shared that correct etiquette. Um, mm -hmm. I shamelessly lifted that system uh thank you thanks for the fact that you cannot pass a game mechanics which means that even social is even possible for characters which have not specced too hard into charisma all it means is that if you have specced into charisma you can just always influence a conversation mm -hmm. so the d6 dice pool system is designed to really promote that specialized knowledge because like as, as great as it is that you know a character could be like oh i think uh, you know the, the the person can be like i think that my you know walking testicle of a melee character should be able to repair this engine because i know how to in real life it's like well roll engineering and you roll two dice and it's like well you're gonna do absolutely nothing compared to the guy who's got you know logic plus engineering of 15 uh, whereas in combat a you want to speed up combat because Christ alive throwing bricks of D6s around. You, you don't really get the swings that, that you'd normally get with the crit success and crit fail system of D&D, &D, if that makes sense. Like, it's really difficult for the underdog to win in that situation, because if I'm lobbing a brick of 21 D6s and you've got 5, yeah, no. It's not, it, like, you know, what whatever the percentage chance is, I, I'll consult my spreadsheet. Um, whereas the D20 plus modifier system means that crits still happen, which is really nice, because it means that the underdog can still win every now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also means that, although there are percentage chances of winning, it, it does give everyone a chance. So, uh, uh, we use a hybrid dice system depending on if you're in or out of combat. When it com when it comes to that d20 use, and since you mentioned crits, I'm curious if you ha if if you um are in the camp of crits equal auto successes or not. Uh, depends on the situation. So in combat, yeah, pr pretty much. If you're all at twenty, you hit is the idea. Uh, d Donk uses a defender always wins rule, so a nat twenty on a defending roll means you can never be hit. Right. Yeah. Uh, However, out of combat, the game uses a soft critical system. So it's if half of the dice read a six, it's a crit success. Half of the dice read a one, it's a crit fail. If you roll four or more dice. So you don't get into those weird states where it's like, okay, can everyone please make me a body test, say, because you've gone into uh, some situation where there's a disease and, you know, some poor fucker rolls two d d6s and gets one one. And it's like, well, it's a crit fail. Guess you die, you know? So that doesn't happen. But secondly, it, it's, it's soft crit system. The way that we phrase it in the book is um, if you get more than half ones and get a crit fail, it doesn't mean you suddenly contracted an dose of, idi dose of idiocy. I hate the fact that most crit fails just result in, well, looks like your character suddenly forgot how to human for like a minute or something like that. Um, instead, it just means something bad happens, usually influenced by luck. So, you know, you can still get five successes, crit failure when repairing an engine. All it means is, oh, you lost one of your tools inside there. You're going to have to fish it back out again. A crit mm -hmm. success, in turn, means that something went well or you did it with particularly good efficacy. But again, it's governed more by luck rather than, and now suddenly you remember that one time you attended a lecture on automotive engineering and you pull it out of your ass despite the fact that your character has nothing to do with that and never has their entire life. So mm -hmm. I'm definitely in the soft criticals camp. Uh, that, yeah. that, that, that's where I find myself. And I'm, ge I'm guessing. I'm guess. I'm guessing that you were more that you were more interested in sh in showing crits and the like than showing um, glitches. Uh, yeah, there's not a glitch system in the game. Probably the only thing which even vaguely has 
glitches in it is explosives, but that's just because it's funny, <laughs> not because it's like, you know, not because anything particularly bad, but um, to be fair, uh, even if there are crit fails, uh, the game does have a luck point system, uh, mm -hmm. which means that uh, it, it's really, it, the, the priority column for that actually is how much money the character gets at the start of the game, as well as their luck, with the reasoning being it's essentially a measure of sort of like luck, which determines how privileged your background is, which determines how much money you've been able to make until now. Uh, but the average luck points that a character will have is two, and that just means twice a set Session, the player can go, actually, I'd rather not blow myself up with a frag grenade, so I'm going to re-roll this uh, D20 roll. Yeah. Uh, it's a qu it's quite a favorable system toward the player. Uh, Lord knows that the players kind of need every advantage they can get in Defense New Century, because mm -hmm. the other big part of the game is the gates. Uh, so there's the more mundane stuff, which is your usual day-to-day -day fighting you know, gangsters or whatever the GM wants to do. But the other big threat in the game, and the thing which actually is sort of the cause of the player's superpowers and the fact that they are contractors, you know, people with contracts, is that there are interdimensional gates from which pour out whatever the GM needs. And that shit is dangerous. <laughs> that is very dangerous by design. That is your scary, you know, Eldritch Horror, War of the Worlds, Alien Planets, just nasty stuff which the players are going to need to really tool themselves up for in order to succeed. And when it now, one of the things I noticed looking at the at the uh, character sh at the twofold one is the is the um intro is bringing in um qualities which yeah some, would it be fair of me to say that qualities have some things in common with feats from um, twenty yeah. Yeah, in, in, in the sense that they give sort of unique bonuses to a character, yeah. Uh, probably the distinguishing point is that the game does use an experience point system, so all qualities were not made equal. Absolutely not. Like, some of them are worth 50 XP, some of them are worth 8. You know, depends. Yeah. The other thing I'm curious about is this pyramid thing that I, that I see with the uh, sheets. Aha, uh -huh, yes, the spells. <laughs> mm hmm Yeah, so the game uses a spell slot system uh, for the way that magic is cast. Uh, it So... The magic, this is more informed by how I like magic to be done, I suppose, mm -hmm. where I like magic to be important, you know, I really hate the idea of, you know, not like cantrips being the only thing that a wizard can do, but I like the idea that mages are powerful, you know, like they, they wield forces of nature, this should be a scary thing. Uh, so on the one hand, I found it really important for magic to have that sort of big ritual aspect to it. But on the other hand, in the game, it, you know, I also didn't want it to be the case that if a player wanted to cast a spell, they've got to find, you know, a tuft of angel feather and, you know, some beeswax and whatever. Uh, so instead, uh, all characters have to do in order to cast spells is sing. That's it. It's just verbal components. The, the, each spell is unique to the caster, so everyone can come up with their own lyrics for their spells if you want to, which you found to be a really popular feature in the game narratively. Mm -hmm. um, and then you cross off the spell slot, and uh, it's done entirely on that pyramid system, uh, as far as the spells go. Uh, that rigidity uh, and the fact that it is a lot more scientific is maybe something which a lot of people might not either might not be used to or alternatively may not you know like particularly. Uh, but what I would say is the fact that that sort of groundedness is so important for the setting. It's really important for being able to manage builds because being able to say, oh, I can cast level 5 wind magic is an important thing to a lot of people who want to make, say, a melee build and the level 5 wind magic is fly, for example. It's always going to be fly. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, uh, you know, if, if people want to make their own spell or their own method for their own spell, that's what the contract system's there for. Probably the most common contract which could be a spell uh, that is not a spell in the game is necromancy. We get a lot of necromancy contracts uh, just because people like raising the dead, and that's a spell which they like. But um, there, it, it wouldn't fit to have a whole school of that in the game, so instead it's just sort of left uh, to that contract release valve, as it were, and that's been a really useful way to have as much freedom as possible whilst at the same time having a balanced game experience. Yeah. Now, when it comes to... When it, com when it comes to... Um... When it comes to spell casting, since since you've you've mentioned you've mentioned influences from from D and D and um, Shadowrun, um, yeah, this is where this is where I think it's interesting to note the um two the the two styles that they have now. Of course, D and D fourth edition, everything was everything was done through their powers, whether it be yeah the yeah, whole well, edu thing, um, yeah. Whereas with Shadowrun, they had the whole notion of drain where you um 
you did you didn't have to deal with um you didn't have to deal with slots that you that you'd only get back after an eight hour rest because Jack Vance, but instead you'd have to deal with um spe with spells tiring you out or a bad roll with spells blowing up in your face. Um, where in that paradigm would you say spell would you say spell use for um donk fits since. Uh, I'm glad that you're laughing as you say donk because we think it's an excellent acronym. I must mm -hmm. say, uh, the the original title of the game was Contractor, but if you type in Contractor RPG, you get a whole bunch of rocket launchers. So that didn't seem like a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, we sit definitely more on the D and D end of that paradigm. Uh, the real reason why the spell slot systems there is because a big aspect of the game is planning ahead for you know what spells you're going to need for the day. But in particular, teamwork is such a massive part of the game. Uh, it, there's so many design systems in the game which is trying to discourage people from lone wolfing it or being the chaotic neutral rogue <laughs> as it were you know like it just the, the game really doesn't you know have a lot for them it's very difficult to um reach the highest sort of damage thresholds or biggest capabilities in combat just by yourself mm -hmm. uh, so a big aspect of that is at the beginning of the day i really didn't you know, I didn't want it so that way the mage could just pull out whatever they needed at the time without thinking about it. I wanted it to be at the start of the day. They turn to everyone and go, okay, you have a rifle. I'm going to use Sonic Wave, which is a really useful spell for if you've got a long-range weapon. So I'm going to put a load of Sonic Waves in, but well, at the same time, here's this guy over here who is a melee character, and I know that every now and then it's really useful if we teleport them out of trouble. So I'm also going to attune the spell slot for one of these teleports. And it means at the end of the day, you're going to have a couple of spell slots that you haven't used, but a part of the mastery of being a mage, as far as I'm concerned, is understanding what spells you're going to need in the future and planning accordingly. Because that kind of planning is sort of central to being a wizard, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that, that was always it from my mind. Like, planning a ritual with a bunch of buddies is kind of the ultimate expression, the sort of druidic element of being a mage uh, I'd say is the ultimate expression of being a mage mm -hmm. it uh, doesn't feel good to play a stupid mage you know you, you, you want to feel powerful and intelligent and like you are actually manipulating the universe um, and in the and in that particular regard and I, I will admit that I've had that um the event that the Vancian model that D&D &D and a few other games have, have used for a while have have has been the subject of ridicule on on my end Largely because when you have when you have a limited resource, players will want to be very conservative with that resource. That's not me. That's not me passing judgment on anybody doing that. It's just it's just how we work as people. Yeah. Um <laughs> there might be a bigger giant enemy crab around the corner. <laughs> yeah, and you, I've seen it plenty of times, and you've probably seen it plenty of times, where somebody keeps saving that spell for a rainy day, and before they know it, the campaign is over. Yeah, <laughs> or the or the session is done for the day, and they never got a chance to use that nuke. Um, how would how would um something like that be addressed? Would it be addressed by having it so that, ev so that it's very easy to have a character who's hybridized? Yeah. Uh, so thanks to the classless nature of the game, uh, over the course of an entire campaign, characters receive about 200 experience points. Now, I know that you don't really have much of a reference for what that means, mm -hmm. but about 100 XP is required to make a character decent in one thing. Probably about 150 to be really great in a particular style. So, you know, that that's spears or medicine or, you know, or being a wind mage. That extra 50 XP is there as that sort of spare change to make sure that you can go in something else if you want to pretty much every mage in the game at some point has has a point in the game where they use one of their actions and they go okay i've moved and i'm channeling a spell and it's like okay what's your second action and they have nothing to do and this that session they all pick up a revolver or a rifle or something similar because then suddenly they've got another way of dealing damage that being said i i <sighs> I, I know, I, hand on my heart, I know you may be disbelieving here. In the time that we've been playtesting this with near five groups over the course of four and a half years, we have never once had the problem where the nukes didn't get used because the gates are fucking scary by design mm -hmm. and the game is difficult to the point where I, we've really never had the situation where it's been like, oh, what if we save the bigger giant enemy crab? It's like, no, this giant enemy crab is fucking horrible and we need to deal with it right now. Uh, 
we we don't really have that kind of problem really i don't think in the game um it also helps with the fact that depending on how the gms want to do the gates and i suppose i should espouse a bit more on them uh depending on what the gates are to different gms they can be portals to different worlds or they can be invading aliens or they could be something else what that means that one of the sort of three cornerstones of the game is gate expeditions and you know that expedition depending on your gm can be uh you know mainly exploring blasted wastelands for several hours where you encounter one score scorpion then you find an artifact and make your way back and it's like a hell march through a desert uh, mm -hmm. or for other people they're 100 meters in radius at the middle of it there is a gigantic alien machine and you've got to break it and it's a lot easier at that point for the mage characters to go well i know where my nuke is going and a lot of that will depend on your gming style but the advantage of the first one as well is if the mages use their nuke they can just go home for the day if they want to and replan and do something else mm -hmm. uh it's not a game where you can just you know go in block headed and think that you'll make it it's so important to have that plan and that's the advantage of the dice pool system as well i, I think M M mercy do i love D, D for the simplicity of the advantage system and the d20 plus modifier system but what i really found to be difficult was if you are an absolute god at something in D, &D you get plus five if you are some nobody you get plus zero that doesn't feel great as a modifier you know, like like it, it it doesn't feel good to know that all that separates you from some schmuck is a sixteen percent chance or thereabouts, you know, of of succeeding on a roll compared to them. Meanwhile, with the dice pool system, if you go into a gate that's super cold, like Arctic temperatures, okay, well, I've got body four, and I've also used my tailoring knowledge skill in order to make a massive sewn overcoat. So that's plus four dice. Also, we've decided to use some of the oil that we found before in order to insulate ourselves. That's another four dice. And soon enough, you do have, like, you know, well, here's 12 dice. And it feels good to be able to add your specialized knowledge. And the game strongly encourages that, strongly. Yeah. Now, when it com now, when it comes to, indi when it comes to individual, spe individual spells... Um, there's two. Th there's two things that. There's a few things that I'm curious about. First mm -hmm. is, um, the idea of affinity when it comes to magic schools. Yeah. Um. Like, would if someone has affinity for for a certain school, would, which I'm get, which I'm guessing that getting affinity count is a um quality that they'd have to purchase. It is. Would, yeah, you get one free on character creation, but yeah, it's, it's a quality. Would it would affinity j mean that it's e that they get a bonus to casting, or would it mean that they get that um they're able to buy at, buy at a lower rate? So the nitty gritty of how the spells work is affinity grants you unique quality, which really depends on the school of magic. Mm -hmm. So for example, affinity in fire magic means you are immune to your own magical flames. Uh, that's a really big deal for quite a few um, melee builds because uh, magic is universal uh, in this game, which means mm -hmm. that once you sub the level one spell is a firestorm, uh, which is it's a sphere with a radius of hang on, are you okay if I work in meters or do you want me to convert into feet? Um, I don't since since we're off the clock and we don't want to do and we don't want to <laughs> do too much math. Go with meters. Okay, sure. So so it's a it's a two meter diameter sphere firestorm. Mm -hmm. It's pretty big. That's the level one spell. Magic is meant to be big and powerful. So being immune to your own magical flames helps that. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have the affinity in the magic school, uh, it also allows you to detect other fire mages and other fire magic easily. Where the modifier to casting comes in is uh, you can either what's called flash cast a spell, which is roll a d20, and then if you beat threshold, depending on the level of the spell, it goes off. Or you can channel over multiple turns, we add multiple d20s. And then if you have mastery in a spell, uh, it decreases the threshold of difficulty by five. So the affinity system doesn't work necessarily with the spell mastery system. Where they come together is if you want to attain the heights of magic in the game so level six which is the biggest one mm -hmm. you need to have an affinity in a school all other five spells mastered only then do you get the sixth spell and you get advanced spell mastery and an advanced affinity so you can detect other mages even easier and the spell all spells are easier to cast for you uh, the first two spells are free to cast as equivalent. Uh, one thing which is important in the game uh, is the fact that the level 6 spell, uh, there is an attached GM's guide to the book. The actual book itself will just be one big thing. It's just mm -hmm. going to be one 250-odd page book. And uh, there is a small GM section in it. And in there, there are sample level 6 spells. Uh, but it's strongly encouraged that GMs come up with their own, which are really related to their own setting. So, for example, yeah. the level 6 fire spell is, the base one, is it sets a fire that will just keep burning until its fuel is spent. That's it. If you start 
starve it of oxygen, the moment you reintroduce oxygen, it'll go up and ignite again. Mm -hmm. uh, another method that somebody's done is where it rather just sets you with like this massive cloak of fire, and it means that anyone who comes near to you is set on fire and takes a lot of damage. Or alternatively, one of them was just summon a massive fire dragon, which is also really cool. And uh, that's probably the only bit of flexibility that the um, magic has, but it is very strong, and it's been it's been it's, it's been enjoyable to play with it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes now, this is what now we may this may have got this may have gotten glossed over and I, and I just and I just didn't I just didn't see it. But when it comes to the pyramid thing that's on the character sheet, is that a means of limiting how many um, spells per each level that a um, yeah. character can have? Yeah, so uh, so on the sample character sheets, which you can get with the quick start, they let a list of spells. But um, uh, essentially, a level one mage gets one level one spell a day. A level two mage gets one level two and two level ones. A level three mage gets one level three, two level twos, and three level ones, and so on. Uh, so you essentially cross off spell slots in a diagonal going up the pyramid uh, until all the way at the top when you have the level six magic, where you've got one level six, two level five, three level four, and so on going down the pyramid. And I'd I'd say that I would definitely say that's a more interesting way of distributing spell slots than, um, three, say, three point five's um, whole thing whole thing of whole thing of spells per day in that matter. And yeah. since you're not using levels, you can actually get away with using levels for spells because that's always been something that I've never been a fan of. Of okay, I have to deal with um care. I have to deal with character level. I have to deal with class level. And if I'm playing a caster, I have to deal with spell level. Um. And that and that can easily get confusing. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's it's relatively straightforward in that regard. Where each school has got five spells, so I'll I'll, I'll use um I'll use something which is a little bit different in terms of words. Let's let's go for wind magic. Mm -hmm. uh, so the level one wind magic spell is sonic wave. You can put a level one spell in a level one, two, three, four, five, or six spell slot. The level two spell is Zephyr. You can put Zephyr in two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So you can assign any spell to the level it's supposed to be or higher. And that's it. And it's just a one-to-one -one slot system. Uh, so if you want to, if you just want to be uh, so Sonic Wave, uh, lets you ignore a bit of armor on the next attack that you make with a weapon, and it great gains range. So mm -hmm. say you just want to be a wind sniper, and that's been a really popular build. Uh, so consequently, what you do is, is rather than going too far into wind magic and mastering other spells, which costs experience points, instead you just master Sonic Wave, and you fill your entire pyramid with Sonic Waves, grab your mm -hmm. rifle, sit 100 meters away, and that's your job done. Every turn, you cast a spell, fire a shot, cast a spell, fire a shot, keep going. When it, when it, comes, when it, comes, to the, when it comes to that... Um... Would there be di would there be different effects depending on the depending on the level of oh yep a uh, so each spell each spell scales uh, with depending on the level that it's cast at mm -hmm. so um uh, as an example uh, lightning bolt uh, lightning bolt's effect reads declare a target within sixty meters you create a bolt of lightning originating from yourself that travels to the target the target struck by this bolt takes one plus spell level cast at d twenty damage so at level one it does two d twenty at level two it does three d twenty and so on yeah and. When it when it comes to when it comes to the qualities, one one a couple of things I I wanted to ask. One of them is with qualities, is it going to be one big alphabetical list, or are you arranging them based on based on certain themes? Uh, both. Uh, so there is a quality table in terms of alphabetical order mm -hmm. uh, in the game. Uh, there is also a typical build style slash type. Uh, so I'm currently looking at the table for it now. And uh, so uh, so just reading off a couple of examples, we've got analytical mind, which is classified mm -hmm. as a research quality, anticipation, explosives, anti-venom, healing, uh, archer, archery. And uh, you can consult either of those tables. Uh, for beginners, now, I really didn't want to have too much of an influence on how people want to take their builds because mm -hmm. honestly a lot of the joy is watching the weirdness that they go uh, but there are a few qualities which just aren't intended to work with one another but just you know like like they're just so easy to see how well they'd work together yeah. uh, so, so for example the taunt quality is one where you can spend six composure which is the secondary health bar to make an enemy attack you there is also a quality which reads you take six less composure from all sources so those two together mean you can taunt the map if you want to and just have every enemy attack you uh so there are a few recommended combinations that are in there but only a few very much yeah. only a few. and i i will admit some of the quality names i um i got i got a particularly 
particular chuckle out of one of them being one of them being referred to as "fuck you" in particular. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the explosives one. Yeah, if you hit one target with explosives, double damage. <laughs> yeah, I, I I got a kick out of writing a lot of these. <laughs> yeah, and when it comes when now obviously there are some there are some qualities that are going that are going to be negative, which I um. I'd assume would it's... add to the add to experience. Um, uh, yeah, you get twenty five XP at the start of the game, uh, have, which you can spend. Has there time. has um has there been a concern about that creating a min max situation? Uh, so you're limited uh, to 25 experience points uh, worth of negative. You don't get any more after that point. Uh, so, for example, the negative quality blind is worth 25 XP. So your character can be blind, uh, and then that's their negative quality. Uh, they can't get anything more than that. Uh, negative qualities are common, uh, and it's recommended that players take them. Uh, what we'll usually see is particularly for some of the... Um, harsher negative quality so for example if you're blind uh that's obviously a big detriment however what a lot of people will then do is then take a contract which for example a contract which does sonar as an example mm -hmm. uh which means that their character can engage with you know the normal stuff that the players can but they've got to think around it and have different solutions um yeah th there's a much shorter list of negative qualities compared to positive qualities because ultimately it it's weird because with negative qualities it's important to have qualities which can be represented mechanically but on the other hand and you don't want stuff that's just role play. So one of the most contentious ones we had was vengeful, which is basically just your character is vengeful. Mm -hmm. But what we found was is that you know there were some characters who then wanted to be not vengeful because their character was growing into not a dickhead. So consequently, it was like, well, either I make you into a dickhead, and that's really not where either of us want to go with this character, or you just got free XP. So that that list has definitely been cut down as time goes on, and it's mainly just like unfortunate things or um. A couple of conditions. So, for example, Butterfingers. If you're all on that one, you you, you drop your weapon, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, Hemophiliac. When you take uh, enough damage, you, you, your your wounds struggle to close. Things like that. Yeah. And when it, when it comes to some when it comes to when it comes to something like Vengeful, I will admit if some if somebody asked me how I how I'd um have that run, I'd probably tr I'd probably treat it like since you're familiar with um Warhammer Fantasy to a bit, I'd probably treat it like their Book of Grudges. <laughs> yeah, the dwarves classic. <laughs> it's going in the book. Yeah, um, <laughs> I tell you what, the uh, what was it? Total Warhammer was excellent for the book of grudges. I love that for the dwarves. But yeah, now oh, that, yeah. that that yeah, I was gonna say the thing is, uh, you know, the game is designed so that way GMs can add their own stuff. You know, custom qualities are very much a thing. You know, uh, there is a short guide in the GM's guide for so you want to make your own quality slash negative quality. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so as an example, uh, as a rule of thumb, any quality which says the character gains an extra action at some point in combat once they fulfilled a condition, that should be twenty five experience points. Or alternatively, one that says the character deals on average seven more damage should be about ten experience points. So there are guides in there for if the you know GM wants to add the book of grudges as a quality, mm -hmm. and I might nick that. So you know. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, there's a when it comes to customization because obviously with um with with the importance of engineering and the rise of pe of um people being able to. Um, make cut make more customized equipment given yeah. given the setting um do you have do you have plans f for um for rules on people wanting to make custom we weapons armor and si and similar kit uh yeah uh, it's it's in there so uh the game's got a a mechanic called research tasks which is where your character can improve themselves as time goes on and uh, that's one of the big ways that logic characters can improve themselves because it basically means that if you're high logic or a high willpower character you essentially gain you know some free xp over time in terms of you can invest that in skills or attributes but uh for example there's the quality cartridges which means you can make you know um uh explosive cartridges or ones that go with lightning fire or water magic mm -hmm. uh there's prosthetics uh, in the game there's uh there was a real emphasis on prosthetics actually uh, from the start because um uh, a lot of the visual design took cues from Full Metal Alchemist mm -hmm. because I think that's just it's it's weird because because as much because uh, earlier you described the game as steampunk but it's kind of strange because uh, 
it's it's not many people have taken I'd, up the steampunk I, aspect of it. It's it's been a lot more I was like you know. I was half joking when I br- when I. I, uh, I know you were. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'd say yeah. I'd say the way the way you've described um, Donk, it has more in common with diesel punk. Yes, yeah. I, I, I was going to say that 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 little subgenre of it, and it's like it's got that. It, it it's like it's more Full Metal Alchemist and Legend of Korra than it is, you know, like your sort of standard um, steampunk stuff. Not not that got anything in steampunk. Uh, we've had a very successful steampunk game, which is kind of uh, War of the Worlds inspired mm-hmm. as well. Um, but prosthetics have kind of been in there from the start. And like, you know, probably one of the earliest and most popular characters we had was a character who was missing an arm and he was an explosives expert. So he wanted a grenade launcher built into his arm. And I said, that is brilliant. So the maximum you could take a skill to is 15. So all I said to him was, well, if your character's got at least engineering of eight, I will allow you to have in the past made this item. And there is guidance in the book for if people want to make their own stuff. But at the same time, it's called a fabrication research task. And it basically just says, if your characters want to make this super equipment, it's again, on average, they need this many successes to make an item which will give them this much damage if that makes sense it's mm-hmm. kind of vague and a lot of that has to be left to the gm because i i don't want to come up with every you know solution that uh, a particularly industrious party would come up with but th- there's a big emphasis on that in the game so uh, th- there's there's some systems in there some systems and when it comes now when it comes to you already mentioned the whole th- the whole thing with them um, at with etiquette um yeah when it comes to one of the other things I saw was context. Now, with context, yeah. is there is there an inbuilt assumption that a, that even a starting character is going to have some contact that they're associated with, somebody yep. or network that they're associated with? Yep. So at the beginning of the game, uh, every character receives a free national and professional etiquette. A national mm-hmm. etiquette is just where you're from. So obviously that's translatable across you know all games. You know that's just like whatever countries you have in your setting. That gives plus two to social roles. Uh, it's okay. That's that you know it's it, it's not as good as professional etiquettes. Uh, professional etiquettes are ones which give you bonuses depending on if you share a profession with the other person. So there's an ex- there's a list of examples. Obviously you can make your own. So you know um, just listing off of them. There's academic, blue collar, criminal criminal, engineer, explorer, medical. Uh, the list goes on there, and obviously the gym can make their own. Those give plus four. So they're double the strength, as it were. Uh, and at the beginning of the game, every character receives a number of contacts equal to their charisma divided by three. The game is always round up. So if you've got four charisma, charisma over three translates to two contacts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those contacts you get like plus six to, and it's assumed that they will always be willing to do you favors. So... Uh, it's you know I think charisma is probably charisma and logic are definitely two of the things which, as the tabletop industry evolves, I think are going to be addressed in the most different ways going forward, because it's like none of you know very few of us I should say are going to be experts in proper military strategy, you know, mm-hmm. like the actual army training kind of stuff. So, but that that's kind of built into the rules. It's already implied, isn't it? You know, where it's like when I when I say I want to hit the man with my sword, that you know, it would be unreasonable of most GMs to turn to me and say, "Would you like to do that an ox stance or another stance?" And it's like I don't know. Uh, but at the same time, there's almost that weird implicit assumption that when your character says something to another character, you know, it it, it can be a lot harder to turn around and say okay i want to buy something off of them and then the gm will turn around and say well tell me what your character would say and it feels like there's almost a weird double standard there i don't have the solution i don't think we'll come up with one in one very cold podcast Mm -hmm. uh but i think that's definitely going to be something going forward that more games are going to have to address more seriously and uh on, on donk's end uh the game is just designed to be as inclusive in that regard as possible uh there's the contact system and the etiquette system because i wanted every character to be able to engage with the charisma system Uh, at the beginning of the game every character receives six times their logic uh in free knowledge skill points knowledge skills are tailoring or rugby or nobles or anything and the idea behind that was i wanted i wanted even the most bona fide moron of a character to all to you know when something is in their arena like you know okay we're going into an oceanic gate and the fisherman character can be like oh my god this is me like you know i can actually say what we need to do here you know well, what, um, what i know what i noticed with the knowledge skills and this is something that um addresses a pet peeve that I have had for a long time. Knowledge skills in many RPGs are solely dictated by intelligence or some equivalent. Um, 
3.5 and Pathfinder are very large offenders. Um, something like 4th edition decided to integrate knowledge into the other skills, which I think was actually a smart move. Yeah. But when you have so much emphasis placed on that one attribute where you're e- you're either a super you're either a um you're either a super genius einstein wannabe or you're a numpty yeah that's um, it <laughs> i find that i know i'm probably breaking some rule by being an american by using that term but i don't care oh, no, it's wonderful please do more <laughs> but, we both speak the same language mate come on <laughs> but I feel I feel like there shouldn't be that level of a get of a um gap of somebody be, being either a genius or an idiot. There yeah, are you're right. people who are right in the middle who are right in the middle of that who know a few things here or there, but they're not going to be um they're not going to be an adjunct professor anywhere. No, and and uh, the other thing which I really hate about that is it removes the other kinds of intelligence. You know, uh, you know, I I don't know. You know, if you know many people who are university educated, but I know a lot of university educated people who are morons, myself included. Um, and I've got a couple of people who, you know, like dropped out of high school and like, you know, fuck me, watching them talk about a subject they care about. It's like, I feel like a raving dumbass or more so than usual. So, you know, it removes the other kinds of intelligence, which is a complete tragedy. Um, the, the one advantage the game has there is uh, the attribute system is completely linear. So it's not this... I. I yeah, I, I promised myself when I come in, I wouldn't complain too much about other games, but D&D's archaic. 10 to 11 is plus 1. 12 to 13 is plus 2. What the fuck? Like, that doesn't mean anything. Um, first it, first it, off, don't feel bad about compl- about complaining about uh, about other systems, because, well, for one, this is the open bar, anything goes. Two, cheers. art is a response to other art. And a lot yes. of pe- and a lot That's of people will get into creating something because they feel that what they, what they want to see isn't being represented. Okay, uh, that's exactly what I've done. So I'm glad you said that to open up the floodgates. Because yeah, that is why I made my own games because I got tired of what other people didn't have in theirs. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so like the game has that linear system. So you know. Um, the, the 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 scale is uh one to ten, but average is like three or four, and because seven to ten is like Herculean sort of height. So you know, mm-hmm. if a character has three logic points, you got eighteen knowledge skill points, and like that is enough for most people. I tell you, like like you know, we we get to the level of like where some characters have logic seven, and they know all about these disparate academic subjects, and it's a struggle to come up with more subjects than just history, geography, math, the science, you know. <laughs> I'm guessing as well that you di- that you didn't want to get bogged down in um, skill specializations, which is something oh, that Shadowrun no. struggles with struggles with as well. No, 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 no. It's a uh, you know it, we're, we're very loose in that regard. Like you know, if you want to make a blacksmith, you should probably have a couple points in engineering because it's a cover all skill. That being said, if you have two points in blacksmithing as a knowledge skill, the standard role is logic plus engineering plus blacksmithing. So again, mm-hmm. you don't need to be a complete genius in order to specialize. Like you know, the knowledge skill system is a bit of a release valve uh, in that regard. I use that term a decent amount in the design because I feel like. It's easy to visualize design like that, where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, if something's not represented in your game, it's because there is a mechanic that doesn't service a narrative, if that makes sense. And, like, you know, yeah. that, that, that freedom is so important in that. The, in, in the, the main thing, the main thing that came to mind with me for, for this sort of thing is, um, is, stu- is stuff like wep- is stuff like weapon skills. Because when, when you, when you think about it, if somebody, it, if somebody is, say, an expert swordsman, in yeah. a lot in a lot of games that utilize a skill based system, if you try and give them if you try and give them any other um, weapon, they would they um would look at it like you got steam and turrets hanging out of your mouth. Yeah. Um, but when <laughs> the... you look at a, when you look at a lot of swordsman type characters in fiction, that doesn't really apply. No, they they're at they've been trained in basics. Yeah, and uh, a, a lot of the games about it, so um. Uh, one thing which I can say about the weapons is mm-hmm. that there is a weapon table, uh, but for example, it is uh, so one grade of weapons is one-handed strength weapons. Uh, there is no warhammer or longsword or anything like that in the game. Uh, mm-hmm. If it could conceivably be used in a strength way, it's a one-handed strength weapon. 
you yeah. know uh and that's designed to serve that because the difference is just you know i i love halberds right i don't know what it is about my brain maybe there's just something very central germanic about my brain right but i love the halberd i think it looks gorgeous as a weapon every time i play D, &D i always had to talk to the dm and say listen right the halberd is wank in this game. Can I please use the spear and just recolor it? And they'd always say yes. And I, I was always annoyed that I had to make that conversation, you know. Um, but yeah, so the difference is mainly aesthetic. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that we got that in the game. And uh, uh, not to mention the fact that it, you know, it, every test in the game is done as an attribute plus skill thing normally, uh, which means you know, if you've got seven points in strength, yeah, you can use a pole arm to quite a high degree of proficiency. It just means that you're not an expert in using it. Yeah, which which to which to me which to me makes sense. Um, which to most people, I suspect. Yeah, um, something else that I de that I definitely saw that that I got I got a kick out of was it was the inclusion of bloodied, which was some, which yes. something that I always felt that was a very interesting idea that that throughout throughout fourth edition's run wasn't used to its full potential. I love it. It's so simple. Like, it's it's a wonderful mechanic. You know, some GMs really struggle with the idea of players turning to each other and saying, how injured are you? I've taken 20 hit points. And, you know, some GMs don't like that. You know, are you bloodied? Yes or no? It's such an obvious, simple indicator, and it's such, it's, it's nice to have it in such a binary state. I really like the bloodied mechanic. <laughs> and the main, re the main the, um, thing that I would often use with, with it... And while while some while some creatures used it for this, not enough did, in my opinion. Is there are certain actions that you can only t you can only take when you're bl when you're bloodied because they're a lot more powerful. I will admit Final Fantasy being a bit of an influence, what with the whole limit break thing that's been that's been around since yes. Yeah. Um, oh, did you ever play the game Soul Sacrifice? It had a very similar thing. In yes, that. I still yeah. I um. St I've played the original and Delta. Um, oh, I Delta love that is, game. Delta is better. I still have the soundtrack for that one, and um, there has been a few scenes where I've used the track "A Certain Magician's Life." Um, I can't say I know the I can't say I know the OST that well, but I'll tell yeah. you a word. I'll listen to it later on. Yeah, um, "A Certain Magician's Life" is the is the track that always plays during the um during the menu between missions. Ah, gotcha. Um, but when, but, um, when it now, I want to shift, I want to shift a bit into the, into the concept of luck, into the concept of luck. Um, yeah. now obviously I've mentioned in several times, in fact, it's almost a running gag with my reviews that games need some sort of extra effort, uh, system. Shadowrun yeah. has edge, world of darkness has willpower, um, D and D fourth edition had action points. Um, Warhammer has fortune. You get the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, when it comes to luck, is it is the main use of it as a do over, or are there other uses for it? Other uses. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned willpower as well, because the game does have a willpower system, and uh, that's used as a bit of an alternative for some actions. So, for example, you can run, which drains some of your composure, which is a secondary bar determined by your willpower, so you can go mm -hmm. further. Uh, but luck, I'm, I'm looking at it now, so it's got the, it's got four main uses, which is take an extra action, uh, re-roll any number of dice in a single dice roll, Use your contract again uh, on on an initiative pass. You can only use each contract you've got once, and uh, move to the top of initiative order or act before an opponent. That's the main uses of luck. Uh, the extra action one probably actually gets used more than the reroll. I'd say mm -hmm. uh, the the game has probably one of the yeah one of the other ones that the game has. Uh, every turn you get two actions. You can use an action to move, or you can use it to attack. So you can attack twice, or you can move twice. Uh, mm -hmm. I. I, I found that it was quite important to have that because it rewards good positioning. Because games that have the move and then take a major action, more often than not, if you're in a good position, uh, you're wasting your movement action. And I feel that that just doesn't reward clever positioning enough. And taking taking that into account, um, do you consider do you consider this to be a game that would lean more towards grid map play, theater of the mind, or could it hand or could it potentially handle both? Uh, probably so. Theater of the mind or free hand on a whiteboard would be it for me. Uh, so grid 
was experimented with, but bluntly it was just too restrictive. Uh, because of the nature of the contracts and the magic, drawing circles, cylinders, squares, every conceivable sort of shape happens a decent amount. Mm -hmm. uh, and people can play on a grid if they want to, but one meter is the lowest resolvable distance in this game, and it does matter. Th th those distances do matter because of the amount of effects that could be put in the game. Uh, as theater of the mind can be done outside of combat, I would be lying if I told you that playing this game just purely theater of the mind in combat was easy. It's not. Uh, playing it on a whiteboard is necessary. Now, that's not because every centimeter matters. Um, you know, although, admittedly, if you are the kind of person like Warhammer 40k, you really can do it at that level if you want to. But it's the fact that most spells last three turns. Uh, most contracts also last three turns, or they can last one turn, or be instant. And at any one time, characters can use a quality called formations, and the formation qualities let everyone on the battlefield take an extra action or do more damage or whatever. So you fairly constantly have a load of effects going off with different turn timers, and theater of their mind is great if people can keep a track of their own turn timers, but it, there's a lot going on in the game. The, 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 the combat just isn't that simple, so I'd say probably whiteboard and pens mm -hmm. is, 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 has been the best way to go in combat for us. Yeah, and taking that into account, how well, how well, is, the game, how, how well is the game held up when it comes to using virtual tabletops like Roll20 <laughs> <Yeah. Zombie? laughs> I can't imagine why you'd ask about that. Nobody's playing only online tabletop at the minute. Don't be silly, Mildred. No. <laughs> yeah, so, well, well, I write that at the beginning of the uh, of the quick start guide. It's like a lot of people seem to be playing online for some reason recently. Uh, it handles it fine, yeah. Uh, the freehanded nature of it, uh, honestly, like it sounds ridiculous to say, but this is written into the guide. The best thing we found for online is screen sharing Microsoft Paint. That's genuinely the best thing we found, because um, once you have got the ruler guide on in that game, and the fact that you can freehand draw circles, uh, it, it, it passes the turns really quickly. And uh, just representing everyone by using either small JPEG pictures or by using letters, uh, we found that worked really well. Uh, Roll20 does work alright, but of course it's ma mainly built to be used on a grid system, so it can be used, but you'll find yourself butting heads though, because essentially in the grid system, every square has to be one meter by one meter, so your maps end up being enormous. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it's translated quite well. Um, the reason why I say using pens is most useful whiteboard pens is because um, it's recommended that six colors of pens are used. So black for terrain, green for allies, blue for neutral entities, red for enemies, orange for physical effects, that's like fires and so on, and purple for magical effects. And uh, that, that kind of color grading really helps read the map a little bit better visually. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, though, every GM is going to have their own little spin. Absolutely. Little spin Ab and, um... Absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, 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 this has hardly been monolithic, I, I, I must say. Like, you know, um, uh, one of our playtesting groups is out in Latvia, and uh, one of the main things that they did is um, one of their groups was really into sewing, and basically they would sew these, like, small little maps together with, like, you know, like, like gray little bits of felt representing buildings and so on. And uh, they absolutely loved doing that. And it was amazing to watch the system work just because all you needed was a ruler and the whole thing came alive. Mm -hmm. Now, with that... With that in with that in mind now you've had the quick you've had the quick start out for a for a good amount of time yeah. are you pl are you planning on doing a crowdfund down the line Yes, it'll be uh, done on Kickstarter. Well, you know, hopefully we'll be done on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be put on Kickstarter toward the end of January, uh, is the current plan for everything. Uh, the only reason that that's a little bit of a put an asterisk in it is because Brexit's happening, and it took me a full three weeks to find out whether or not a tabletop role playing game counted as a book for the purposes of tax and import. And uh, it turns out nobody knows. Uh, so we're putting a little bit of flexibility there just because it may turn out that everything truly goes bananas in 2021. Uh, but that being said, it's looking to be crowdfunded. Uh, and once it's crowdfunded, it's one book. Uh, it's getting printed here in the UK, and uh, fulfillment has already been sorted out for uh, Australasia, sorry, Oceania, I should say. Mm -hmm. That's a very old fashioned term. Uh, Europe, the UK, and we're, I'm currently uh, sorting out a US uh, fulfillment because it turns out the US is bloody massive. Um, <laughs> and uh, finding uh, fulfillment centers that can do things either in bulk. But, but only do one half of the country, or alternatively get the whole country done, and spreadsheet seems to be done. But, yep, uh, it will be kick-started. Yeah. Um, as, far as, as far as that whole only one part of the country, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and guess that a few, a few of those, oh, we can only do one part of the country, we're all dealing with that little tri-state area um, on, the, on the East Coast. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I, I, I kind of figured, because no... 
For what it's worth, nobody in the states like likes that particular likes that particular spot, especially New York. Yeah, it's it, 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 it's. I mean, I mean, it's the result of having a, a country the size of a continent where the culture changes dramatically, going from state to state. Let alone, you know, fucking one side of the nation to the other. So yeah, but um, regardless, yeah. So once that's been sorted out, um, yeah, we've already got a printer and, and fulfillment and shipping and so on. And uh, uh, the book is done uh, mm -hmm. as well. It should be worth saying. Uh, all the art's been done. Uh, the art's been done by the talented manga artist Sonia Leong. In addition to that, we're getting uh, Helena Norcott and uh, a local London-based. Um, artist uh, called Claude, uh, Claude to do a lot mm -hmm. of the monster art but um, that aspect is done it's been play tested to buggery um, the mechanics are written up, the lore is written up uh, it's edited it's kind of good to go really so there isn't really much risk with that regard, I certainly won't be going quite pretty much the moment the money's in the bank account it will be sent off to printers and then mm -hmm. it will be a question of where the world is at for how long until the book arrives at people's doorsteps Yeah. well I'll I'll certainly be keeping a, keeping a close eye on on things, especially Thank you very especially much. since I especially for one I like what I'm I like what I'm seeing thus far and two, um, I can, especially get, especially given how some people are still too traditionalist about art styles, I can thumb my I can thumb my nose at grognards yet yet again like I've been doing for the last twenty years. <laughs> yep. Well, I don't think is is another point of Grognar's old old old, com, old complaining was the original French version of that. So yeah, that makes yeah, sense. But no, I, I, um, I've uh, when it comes when when fourth edition came came out, I um I was I was critical of some aspects, but I was also critical of people who were do who were making arguments in bad faith. Let's say mm. the chief among them being the um, MMO comparison, which. I I find to be complete bollocks. Yeah. Um. In part in part because of how of how experienced I am with MMO design and the fact that a lot of people who are saying that were basically using WoW as the as the stand-in, but also I distinctly remember hearing people complain that D and D third edition was was not D and D and was turning D and D into tape into tabletop Diablo, which is doubly Tables ironic. Diablo. <laughs> yes, I okay. swear to God that was the <laughs> argument that was being made in front of me, which All is right. doubly <laughs> ironic because there were Diablo modules for A D and D Second Edition. I think people will just complain about everything, Builder. I wouldn't. I wouldn't pay it too much heed, to be honest. <laughs> oh, I, I don't. I don't pay too much attention to it. But when somebody makes a positive, when somebody makes a positive statement, then they shouldn't be surprised when, when I'm that, when I'm there to kick that in the to kick that in the teeth and and not stop kicking until they get the point. I I just I just do it in a way where I um where I'm gonna make fun of them about about it the whole way because, um. It's a case of not thinking things through when someone makes an argument. And I know everybody's going to go out looking for witches, but um, my whole my whole approach is um, ju is just to mock it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exa exactly. Just, just yeah, laugh in the face of terror. That's mm -hmm. got to be the best thing you can do. But yeah, it's it's interesting you mentioned the art style of it because um, yeah, I, I think I, I'm I'm not going to lie. That sort of '90s anime aesthetic or manga aesthetic, I should say, runs through it since mm -hmm. Full Metal Alchemist. And to be honest, like you know, some of the best characters we've had are characters whose superpowers were inspired from anime because anime is really good for this stuff. You know, <laughs> like a bunch of weird characters who are defending, you know, defending as defenders of the century, defending their world using shadow clones or moving sand or absorbing abilities or you know being able to flick something to death you know? it's one of it's one of those things where i think a lot of people try and try and turn try and turn away from the gonzo end of the end of the spectrum when when you're dealing when you're dealing with any sort of tech punk like thing um i find that i find that trying to Trying to lean, trying to lean against the ridiculous element is, um, so is self defeating. It's like going up, it's like going up river without a paddle. Yeah. When what you should, what ideally you should do instead is lean into it and play and play into it. You know, play to the crowd. That, that, that's exactly it, because everyone's looking to have fun, and, you know, don't get me wrong, there absolutely is a place for grimdark, you play peasants who will get murdered with so much as a sneeze, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, partic particularly with Donk, like, you're, you know, you're not gods among men, 
But at the same time, you're powerful. You you start the game, and you know your sort of power level is that of like you know uh, a very competent soldier slash sort of like you know like a lower officer or something like that. Or you're an accomplished explorer, or you're a famous doctor in your medical field, or you're an up and coming soon to be archmage. It's mm -hmm. meant to be powerful, and it's it's meant to be silly because you because you're meant to feel strong because you need to be strong because what you're going up against is so big and otherworldly and will require the best that humanity has to offer to win and mm -hmm. critically the best that humanity has to offer working together that's always been such a big part of it um and and like and like i like i said the um there can be fun in grim in grim dark and there can be fun in silly but there needs to be some degree of fun um, that's just it. Like, if, if you're, you know, with the Grim Dark one especially, it's like, you know, I love Berserk as much as the next person. Guts is amazing and interesting, and he is that level of stupid and ridiculous. Yeah. It um, was to be, it was too big to be called a sword and all that, but yeah, sorry, go on. Well, when, well, another example, another example I'll, I'll use when it, com when it comes to why you need some degree of silliness, even in, even in Grim Dark, um, I'll give you one word orcs. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Fucking, like you know a whole bunch of people who say doing it for the horde you know like it's like yeah it does it you do need to have that release valve you do need to have that faction which paints race stripes on their on their equipment to make it go faster you know like a friend of mine yeah. once described to me a long time ago that orcs are orcs are what happens when a bunch of football hooligans decide to build an army yes Yes, I mean that's how you get blood ball, isn't it? Like you know, it's it's literally that stuff. It is a yeah. bunch of people who want to throw bottles for their yeah, main you, school, like got, you know, combat style. You've got that. Incidentally, I would pay good. I would pay good money for somebody to do blood bowl, but not in a video game form. But not in the style. Not in the style of the um, board game, but some sort of unholy combination of mutant league football and bl with um, blood bowl's aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, I, I just want a reincarnation of NFL Blitz. I'll just be flat out honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just be. I, I, mean, I mean, you can also uh, sort of in, in, integrate classic elements of like the wrestling games, where you could uh, then just have like a massive punch up going on in the audience. And, you yeah. Know. <laughs> um, or I'd say I'd I'd say the uh, I'd say another example of the of that sort of thing with the, even with how dark the setting is with having with needing some sort of relief is um half of the stuff that goes on with Judge Dredd. Yes. Yeah. Well, Judge Dredd's inherently silly. Like, like, <laughs> well, know, with like Judge Dredd. I, it's that might arguably be a bad example because Judge Dredd was meant to be a parody. Oh well, let, let's go for like the Punisher then. Say where like you know that's very clearly meant to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, as much as it's meant to be really cool and really dark and really standard at the same time, it's a teenage boy's idea of cool. You know. <laughs> He's yeah. big and he's dark and he and he doesn't take prisoners, uh, you know. But then later on, he's throwing criminals into a particle collider, so they experience death a thousand times. And it's like you can't avoid the silly. <laughs> I'd say I'd say when it comes to when it comes to that sort of tone, you need to have an element of um, black comedy. And yeah, I I'll, I'll always remember something that Mel Brooks once said when it came to describing dark comedy. Tragedy is when I. Tra Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I'll admit that, that is a nice delimitation. Oh, and I and <laughs> look, it, look, even even with the most serious parts, the the um the emphasis that I'm trying I'm trying to put with all of these examples is relief. Like you you. On one hand, you on one hand with something like Judge Dredd. On one hand, you can have the, you can have the darkness of the pro democracy terrorist, and on the other hand, you can have that um, possession illegal possession of sugar is is going to get you arrested. Yeah, D dumb shit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so it's so important to have this in this, and it's like you, you know, it, it's funny that you should mention the sort of like you know the ridiculousness of watching someone fall to the milk cover and die because um one weird thing that we saw in the game is so the the death state of the game yeah is that uh, you've got your hp so you've got 36 hp when you hit zero you're unconscious there's not death saves or anything like that um you can sit at negative hp that's fine but once you hit the negative of your max hp so in that earlier example if you hit negative 36 uh, you die okay uh it's an optional rule in the game at that point uh, depending on the gm for uh you can then burn a luck point similar to the sort of shadow run method and then come back uh in a way that is related to the origin of your you know contract and your natural superpowers and the gates because that, that stuff's all linked um 
But what we saw over time is that when players went unconscious, they could actually sit back and take a breather for a minute and just sort of be like, well, I'm no longer responsible for what happens on the field, so I'm just going to watch everyone else. And then the, play, the, the unconscious players really get into seeing the other players suffer and come down to their level and just like, you know, eagerly await crits and just sort of like, yeah, no, you know how it feels. And like, it's a really weird transition point where everyone is suddenly on board with success or failure at the table, which I think is something that only RPGs can do mm -hmm. particularly well. I always hate it whenever, um, uh, so you know, for example, if we take you know the newest Baldur's Gate game. I don't know if you have you played the uh, the the any of that yet? Not yet. No. Well, th the basic thing is is that you know if you you do a d20 roll for everything in that game, if you fail at one of those d20 rolls, it just means you get less content. Um, that sucks because it just means that oh, that, that there's just less here. If you compare that to like say Disco Elysium, where in Disco Elysium, if you fail at a roll, that's just as interesting as the success state of that roll because your character descends more into madness and you want to see that happen. And I really like it in RPGs when that can happen, where as long as the players are accepting the fact that failure is a natural part of this process, you know, getting knocked unconscious and then watching everyone else get devoured by a gigantic spider is like you know suddenly there's, there's a bit of catharsis in in hopelessness isn't there you know mm -hmm. um so that the, we, we found that a lot in the game and, and i like the fact that the game can support that <laughs> and i think that's just a really fun mode of gameplay so that mel brooks quote just sort of reminded me of that the moment you said it just like you know everyone eagerly watching is just some ridiculous misfortune happens to everyone <laughs> yeah um and look we we one of the mantras we have in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy oh yep <laughs> um but with all, with all that said, I'm definitely going to look forward to how, to how it um, develops. And I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. You're more than welcome. Thanks for having me. It's been wonderful. Like, my, yeah, I'll, my uh, pleasure. Yeah, my happy pleasure. to do it again. And, um, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say. Well, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see if the, we'll wait and see what the games come out. Then maybe we can have them in the chat then. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, as I, well, as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yep. <laughs> Cheers to that. Uh, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!